we were on a train early on into the operation. There was a guy sitting on the train opposite with his wife and his two kids. And he had a Crystal Palace lapel badge, just a little badge on his jacket. The guy saw it, he leant across and he punched the bloke squarely in the face and then hit him three more times in front of his wife and his two kids. He were two little girls, he must have been aged four and six. My dad was a police officer. Uh, I grew up in South London and um, I got to about 15 and my friends, we were all going one way or the other and uh, I just fell one side of the fence, they fell the other side. So I joined the police cadets when I was 16. So uh, it, um, it sort of worked on from there really, but it wasn't something that I was actively choosing to do at, at that age, it just sort of fell into it a little bit really. So how from there, how did you get into undercover work? Um, so I left the police cadets, I joined the regular force when I was 18 and a half. I got mentored by a, uh, by a sergeant who used to be in uh, plain clothes. He saw something in me and I started to work in plain clothes from an early, uh, re quite early, within sort of three months. Uh, and then within 18 months I was on a crime squad. I got special dispensation because I was still in probation. I just took to it quite naturally. I was, um, I suppose, what's for want of a better word, chosen to uh, to work in an um, in an undercover environment. At, I was I was 21, so I think it was probably the youngest officer that had done that. Certainly at that time. What does it take to be a good undercover officer? You have to be. Um, you have to be really good at lying uh, and to convince people that you're something that you're not. Uh, you have to have a massive ego uh, in order to put yourself in an environment where you think you can survive. Um, pretty confident. Um, quite bright, in a way, in that you can think on your feet quite quickly uh, in order to get yourself in or out of situations. There isn't a one, there isn't a one specific you don't sort of get, it's not that sort of career or that sort of, that job or that profession that you do, that you could, um, you know, you get to a certain age and they go, oh, you'd be quite good at doing maybe, be good at working undercover. It's just not an exact science. It just is something that either you can do or you can't. So how do you choose your, your undercover? How do you choose what, what specifically you're going to be doing? How you don't. You? You, you, that gets chosen for you, really. The job that I was given was to infiltrate Millwall football hooligans. The police's aim was to, to try and rid uh, that hooligan culture and to get in with the people that were organising and creating the issues and the problems and the fights. And that would involve about the arranging, where they were fighting, the actual fights that they carried out, the assaults and everything else that, that, that goes along with that. So yeah, there are, there are certain clubs that attract a hooligan element. So Millwall, Leeds, West Ham, Chelsea um, were clubs that, that had, a, had, a, had a bigger attraction to football hooligans and Millwall was just was, was one of the top clubs. And it was a reputation that they deserved, for want of a better word, is they were a force to be reckoned with. So I did my research. And I did everything I could to know about the team um, before and the current team and previous teams to try and get as much information. Because you've got to remember, I was suddenly appearing from nowhere. They're quite a tight-knit group of people. And uh, suddenly this, this new face or these two new faces appear. Is You need to try and put yourself in the best position that you can in order to, to progress yourself further up, up, up the ranks, as it may be in relation to football. So can you t uh, talk me through your legend? Yeah, my legend. Um, we weren't given a great deal of help when we first started. And my legend when I initially started was a business card on which that business card was that I was, a, um, I was Jim Ford, I worked for Spectrum Decorating and I um, had an address which was a um, which was an accommodation address in Croydon. That was it. That was my legend. 
Um, I made out that I was from Wandsworth and that I was a painter and decorator. So going in and saying, I'm Jim, you've never met me before. Um, I'm a lifelong Millwall supporter, although I've never been here. And they asked me who I am. I go, well, don't worry, here's my business card. That was about as good as it got. Uh, and we learnt very, very, very quickly that we needed a little bit more. So we started to go into a Millwall pub and we used to go in at lunch times. And then, because no one went in there, and then whilst we went in at lunch times, we would then befriend the bar staff. And we went in for three months, solid, pretty much every lunch, every, every lunch time. So we became regular fixtures. When we then turned up at football in the September, um, you would walk in and the pub would go quiet and everyone would look at everybody as they came in because it was that sort of pub. We walked in, everyone looked at us and obviously the barmaids who were behind the bar recognised us and called us out. And as a result of that, everyone accepted us because obviously the bar staff had accepted us. So on that basis, they asked less questions. We gradually just, we went to, went to the matches, we went away, we started to um, spend quite a lot of money, buy lots of drinks, make sure that we were always there. Uh, and we got a bit lucky. We went on now, we went on a, uh, on a special, on a football special to Leeds. We went on the train and met up with three guys who we got on with. And as a result of that, it forced the relationship and it just went on from there. What were the worst things you've seen? Uh, the most frightening one for me was Arsenal in the fourth round of the FA Cup. So we went and we were at that stage, we were quite well in with some, with, with some of the hooligans. And we ended up, me and the sergeant, in the North Bank, which was the away end of Arsenal. Um, so, yeah, we, we went in. We were in the middle of, so you can imagine it, we were standing there, there was 15 of us. We were surrounded by 8,000 Arsenal. And I'm standing there thinking, this is not good. And one of the guys picked up on it, they were a lot older than me, and said, look, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. Opened his jacket and showed me, and he had a six inch stiletto knife. So I'm now thinking, this, can, this is gonna get, this can be really problematic here. Yeah? And I'm standing there singing along thinking, no one likes us, but actually within me, I'm thinking, I'm gonna f die here. And um, it, very, very quickly, they realized who we were. So the crowd moved out. And then there was, there's, because there always is, the initial start, the first guy came forward. The, one of the Arsenal guys came running towards us, coming towards me, because I was the youngest and probably the smallest. And one of the other guys just stepped out and hit him straight on the nose. And the guy went completely, did a complete 360 and came down and he just crashed onto the concrete terraces. And it was, you can imagine there's quite a lot going on at this stage. It went completely quiet and everyone, including us and all of the Arsenal supporters just went, ooh. And then these two little guys just appeared from nowhere and the crowd sort of opened up and they picked this, grabbed this guy by the legs and pulled him back in. It was a bit like Ben Ur, he just like sort of disappeared back in and the crowd closed and then it all kicked off. And one thing you learn very, very quickly in that environment is that you don't go down. You stand up, because the minute you go down, you're in all sorts of trouble. And so I was just kicking and punching and ended up out on the pitch and um, got arrested. But the guy made a bit of a mistake, because instead of leading me to the tunnel where they take you down, this way, he led me, read me this way, which took me towards 10,000 Millwall. And as we were leaving, I could tell by the way he was holding me that he was starting to get quite nervous. And he'd started and he now couldn't stop. So we started to walk towards the 10,000 Millwall. And I saw my chance and he wasn't holding on to me time. And as we got close to the crowd, I managed to break free. We threw a couple of coppers and then dived in the crowd. And from then on, it was, I, um, I was well and truly accepted. How, how scared were you? I was absolutely shitting myself. Yeah. I feel like that, and, but the adrenaline is absolutely huge. And so you are, it's, you know that you're in that position is you've got, you're not gonna be able to run away in that scenario. You just have to go with what you've got. So yeah, I was absolutely petrified. But at the same time, 
unbelievably exhilarating and you're trying to get yourself in a position where to, to safety. And when you do and you survive, it's quite euphoric. How does it actually feel to, to effectively live your life pretending you're someone else? Um, you just, you get used to it. <clears throat> I just, it was a job. And I know people find that really, they just go, yeah, but, but it was a job. And people, some people love their jobs and some people hate their jobs. And I really love that job, but it, <clears throat> but it was a job. But I wanted to be the best at that, that I, that I could be. And in order to do that, I, there, there were occasions when I had to behave like a hooligan, but that was my job, was to be a hooligan. And so on that basis is I had to display certain characteristics in order to convince people that that's what I was. Because if I didn't, then I wouldn't get the evidence that I needed and I wouldn't be any good at what I did. Did you ever get emotionally connected to anyone? Yeah, of course. So lots of them, they're really, some of them are really nice guys. They just like to have a fight at football. But there are an element that just really aren't very nice at all. And the best place for them is, is not to be on the terraces. I'm just trying to imagine the, kind of the mental strain of... It's horrendous. ...of going through things like that all the time. So the worst, the worst, the, the, the worst situation on the operation was we were on a train early on into the operation. We were travelling to London with a target that we'd just got to know. There was a guy sitting on the train opposite with his wife and his two kids. And he had a Crystal Palace lapel badge, just a little badge on his jacket. The guy saw it, he leant across and he punched the bloke squarely in the face and then hit him three more times in front of his wife and his two kids. He were two little girls. He must have been aged four and six. So for me, I stood up on the seats and started singing No One Likes Us in order to, detract, to try and detract attention. And he stopped. And it worked, because he stopped. The look from the two little girls who were now crying, and the wife, and him, but particularly from the two girls who were looking at me, standing up singing No One Likes Us, I'll never forget. As everything within me and the sergeant just wanted to arrest him. But I couldn't. So we had to endure that rest of that train, train journey with this guy bleeding from the nose, being, confront, uh, being comforted by his wife and his two kids crying until we got off at London Bridge, hoping that he would report it and that at a later date, the guy could be arrested and he could be held accountable for his actions. But he never reported it. So that was, for me, the worst experience during that whole time. Did you ever feel guilty about any of that? It's like all of us, we all question about what we do as we get older, about whether or not it was a good thing or a bad thing. But it was my job. You can't justify it by saying that all the time, but it was, that was what I was there to do. And I chose to take that job. And so for me, it was the important thing was to try and do it as convincingly as I can. And the, the more convincing I was, the safer I was going to be. Have you ever been close to being exposed? We had um, an experience where I, we had an incident where the sergeant who I'd been working with had told the guys that we were working uh, on a job in Catford, which we were, but we weren't there that week. And they'd gone down to see us. And we weren't there and the guys didn't know when they started asking, where's Jim? And, and they just went, we don't know who you're talking about. Because they were doing the roof. We turned up um, on the Saturday and got confronted about the fact that, who are you? We came down to your job and I'm going, what job? I don't know what you're talking about. Because the sergeant hadn't made me aware of the fact that he'd had this conversation. And we ended up in a situation where we got confronted and called out. And again, that was another situation where you just stand there and think, right, what do I do here? is we either run away or we front it up. And I fronted it up. And we got away with it. Did you felt like you were in danger at that point? Yeah, to put it in perspective, 
you're in danger all the time because you are in a scenario where you just don't know what is going to happen next. So it's, but there are different levels of danger. So you put yourself, every time you put yourself or go into a pub or go, into, go, go to a match or do anything, you are leaving yourself, you're exposing yourself to, 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 to danger. It's just about how you deal with that and how, in you, how you best make sure that you can control it as best that you can. So they're just, just, just levels, but all of the time it's dangerous. It's just about how you deal with that and what level of danger is dangerous enough for you to go, I'm out of here now. When you work undercover, could you actually tell your friends or family or anyone what you're doing? The person I was living with well. at the time knew, she knew, but it, had, it has an impact. It is a, um, you know, like you come home and it's like with, with all jobs that we all do is you come home and try and switch off. And, but with that, it's, it's quite difficult. You tend to try and tell the least amount of people as possible, but people will pick up on it is the fact that I went from 12 stone pretty fit with short hair to 15 and a half, 16 stone, long hair, earrings, completely physically different within, within two years. So people will, and you're meant to be a serving police officer and people know that, they would look at you and think, he's certainly not walking the beat, not looking like that. So how long overall did you spend undercover at Millwall? Two and a half years. And what was the outcome of your operation? The operation was concluded on a phone call. It was finished. No one was arrested. Nobody was brought to justice. Nobody was, there was no trial. It, just, it was just concluded overnight um, on a phone call. Why? There'd been some really bad publicity around um, operations, that, the similar operations at West Ham and Chelsea. And both of the trials had collapsed. And they'd collapsed due to police officers making up evidence and lying. Um, and the Chelsea trial was, didn't even get to a, a decision where it was a verdict, it was, it was, it was halted. And it was because it was proven very, very quickly that what was happening is that the officers were, were, fa were fabricating evidence and making it up. And the reason for that is, is, again, it's not an ego thing, it's just, you know, it's just an honest assumption is, they weren't very good. And because they weren't very good, they didn't manage to get the evidence that they needed. So in order to try and convince people that they were better than they were, they made it up. And they got caught out. And as a result of that, the police force, as it was then, the police service, as it is now, decided that that's surely worse. Maybe that's what everyone else was doing. So in order to not have the adverse publicity, the trials, the, all of the operations were shut down overnight, and ours was probably the highest profile one that just stopped. How did it feel for it to end in one day? I was angry, just because I'd spent two, two and a half years, and it was my job, and I'd spent two and a half years of doing this great job and getting this evidence, and there was sufficient evidence for a number of people to have been arrested and charged. And then the way that we were dealt with afterwards was appalling, really, um, considering what we'd done. We were given two weeks off and then put back in uniform and, for me, told to go back to Orbinton and drive a panda car. So, I left. How old were you when you left the police force? 23. I'd experienced an awful lot and seen um, a different side of police officers than I had before. Because obviously, as a working in an undercover environment, they were fully unaware who I was. They just thought I was just another Millwall football hooligan traveling around the country. And um, I didn't see a particularly good or nice side of certainly people that police football back then. And um, I didn't really want to be associated with, with people like that, particularly in that environment, as there's really, really good police officers. But there are an awful lot that aren't very good. And um, so I was quite relieved, really, to be, to be out of that. So yeah, I just looked on it as a new chapter, closed the book, and then and moved on. So did the undercover work change your view of football? No, it changed my view of police. 
It didn't change my view of football. No. I think it was... Um, I enjoyed my time. It was great. It was like, it was, it was, the majority of the time, it was really good fun. You know, I got to... Millwall were, were flying at that time and got into the, what is now the Premiership, now got into the, the old First Division. So we were going to amazing grounds with amazing support. And, um, and I got to do that for two and a half years. So there were some massive positives as a result of that. And they were an amazing team. But yeah, the biggest change for me was, was my attitudes towards, towards the police. So how did that change? I didn't particularly like them very much, if I'm being honest. I don't particular, you know. Again, it's um, we are, you know, we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a situation where, you know, we're being corralled, and the way that police was, the way that football was policed back then was completely different to to how it is now, and it was no surprise that we ended up with the tragedies that we did because of the way that they that they policed and the and the way that they forced people into into and tried to contain them. And again, I've not seen that because it was, and I'm not saying that all police officers, it's just that in that, at that time and in that environment is, they just, they weren't particularly good at what they did. What would you say was the best thing about undercover work? On a personal level, mm -hmm. convincing people that you're something that you're not. Unbelievably satisfying to, to, for people to, you know, again, which is, the acting thing is to, to do a good job and in order to do that for people to believe in your character and so that's probably the most for me was the most satisfying but again probably the most disturbing was the fact that you managed to convince somebody that all these people that you're not which isn't a great thing to do either so it's a bit double-edged really when I started that operation, I was, I was a kid. I was a sp spotty 21-year-old. When I finished it, I was a much heavier, much longer-haired man. And as they were walking around me, one of them would punch me, headbutt me. As this was going on, the guy was looking down at me asking me questions. And I became convinced that I wasn't going to leave there in one piece. 